Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today we're at the Lone Star Flight Museum in Houston, Texas, a mere hour away from Battleship Texas in Dry Dock in Galveston. And uh, I've just found something really cool here on display at the museum. This is a Norden bomb site, and this is the first time I think I've ever seen one in person. If we were photographing this during World War II, we'd probably be arrested for treason. This is one of those uh, top secret technologies that the U.S. military thought was a war-winning device. First, there's a gyroscope, which makes it possible to stabilize the telescope in a vertical position. So that no matter how the airplane rolls or pitches, you have a fixed vertical line of reference. Then, to take care of the sighting line, there's a rotating mirror underneath the telescope. You can see that's the same as having the telescope rotate. That means since the mirror is connected to an indicator, we can see just how fast our sighting angle is closing as we approach the target. Well, first there's our vertical line of reference, which the gyro stabilizes for us. Watch that sighting angle. Notice how it speeds up as it closes to zero, instead of moving down at an even rate like a stopwatch. Now, Suppose the distance from A to B is the whole range. Forget trail for the moment. Even though the sighting angle does speed up for a given altitude and a given speed, there can be only one specific rate of closing. Find that rate and from it the sight will compute the range angle. But wait a minute. You only turn that mirror by hand when you're first trying to locate your target. Look, there's a disc inside the sight rotated by a constant speed motor. Once you get on the target manually by turning your rate knob, you move a roller toward or away from the center of the disc. The further from the center, the faster the roller turns. That means the telescope mirror is driven faster or slower according to the position of the roller. You turn your rate knob backwards or forwards until you found the rate of drive at which the line of sight will stay on the target by itself. It's from the position of the roller when this is accomplished that the sight computes the range angle. You've done all this merely by adjusting the rate knob to keep the crosshairs on the target. But, does the rate index now give you the correct range angle? No, it doesn't. Because you haven't allowed for trail. You allow for trail before you attempt to synchronize. That's what the trail arm is for. When you start your run, you've already set your trail at the correct reading for your airspeed and the type of bomb you're using. By doing this, you move the roller independently of the rate indicator. Since this means you've speeded up your rate of drive beforehand, this calls for a different adjustment of your rate knob and rate indicator to achieve synchronization. In other words, before we start measuring our rate of angular closing, we preset our rate mechanism to allow for the difference between whole and actual range. Does that take care of everything? What's the matter? Oh, the disk speed. Well, that's very simple. The lower, the faster. Yes, that's what it amounts to. You can figure it out for yourself. Remember, we're dealing in angular velocity, the rate of the closing of the sighting angle. Suppose that represented an airplane flying at 10,000 feet altitude. Now, suppose you were flying at only 5,000 feet, but still at the same speed. In that case, you have only half as long for the sighting angle to close to zero. Therefore, the rate of closing must be twice as great. In other words, the angular velocity of closing varies inversely with the altitude. So, before you try to synchronize, you set in the proper disk speed for the altitude you're bombing from. Then, when you clutch in and synchronize with your rate knob, the bomb site gives you the correct rate angle setting for the particular altitude at which you're flying. Norden bomb sites were highly classified and for special missions were often removed from aircraft, such as when the Doolittle Raiders take off of USS Hornet. Um, knowing that that was a one-way trip for these aircraft, the Norden bomb sites are left at home. However, uh, this technology was something that the Axis powers 
really wanted to capture. And one of the first things they do whenever they uh, capture Allied pilots is tell them to draw out the design of the Norden bombsite. And, and so it was accepted practice to have a, uh, a fake design that many of the people in, in your squadron knew. So that if you're captured, you're all drawing the same rough thing and, and they think, oh, that, that must be accurate. This is gyroscopically stabilized and it's linked into the autopilot of the aircraft. So that is feeding information in to the bomb's uh, own guidance mechanism. And it allows the bombardier to take over control of the aircraft during the final bomb run from the bomb site itself. This is a bomber's version of a Mark 8 range keeper, except the Mark 8 assumes that you're firing from a level plane. And this plane is in flat space. This is for an actual maneuvering plane that can be dropping its bombs from a moving target in three dimensions. So even though it's significantly smaller to fit on an aircraft, it is in many ways more sophisticated than the Mark 48 computer. Unfortunately, this design was never as successful as the US military thought. The, the famous saying is that you could drop a bomb in a pickle barrel from 10,000 feet. I assume a pickle barrel was a unit of measurement during World War II. It may be uh, roughly equivalent to you could drop a bomb on a curator from 10,000 feet. Uh, not quite sure the, the dimensions of a pickle barrel there. In practice, uh, it was never quite that effective. However, this is the forerunner to more modern guided bombs that are prevalent on the battlefield today. And one of my favorite things about historic technology is that it's all stepping stones towards what we've got now. What do you think is the most overrated technology during World War II or that technology that just didn't function the way it was supposed to? Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. Today, we appreciate the support of the Lone Star Flight Museum and allowing us to film in their facilities here in Houston, Texas. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to support their mission. Many of their aircraft are still able to fly thanks to the support of their volunteers and donors. You can support Battleship New Jersey by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us and our channel. Thanks for watching.